Joe Biden has picked his running mate. After weeks of speculation, we can now say with certainty that Joe Biden's vice presidential candidate is going to be California cop Kamala Harris. Here is what Kamala had to say about this wonderful honor. When Vice President Biden was in the United States Senate working with segregationists to oppose busing, which was the vehicle by which we would integrate America's public schools, had I been in the United States Senate at that time, I would have been completely on the other side of the aisle. And let's be clear about this. Had those segregationists their way, I would not be a member of the United States Senate. Cory Booker would not be a member of the United States Senate. And Barack Obama would not have been in the position to nominate him to the title he now holds. And so on that issue, we could not be more apart, which is that the vice president has still failed to acknowledge that it was wrong to take the position that he took at that time. Oh, I'm sorry. That wasn't Kamala accepting the running mate spot. That was when Kamala smeared Biden as a vicious, vicious racist during a presidential debate. Uh, Obviously, Joe Biden probably has no idea that they've picked Kamala Harris to be his running mate because the Democratic Party doesn't view people as people. They view them in slots for divvied up identity groups. Well, we will hopefully inform the former vice president as he watches Uh, this show today, and we will break down exactly what this means for the race, what this means for the broader project of the left. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Man, can you imagine how upset Joe Biden's going to be when he finds out that the Democrats picked Kamala Harris is his running mate. He's going to be furious. He'll forget quickly, but he'll be furious for a little bit. My favorite comment from yesterday is from Hudson Dean. Hudson Dean pointed out that according to CNN, it's not looting. It's called undocumented shopping. That's true. That's true. The BLM rioters, they just don't get receipts. But there's no reason to suggest that that's any different than than other regular American shoppers. That's uh, that's probably, (laughs) there's no distinction as far as the left is concerned. Uh, We will get to this significant news, the the Kamala Harris pick. First, though, I've got to thank our friends over at ExpressVPN. You know, There's a lot of censorship these days on social media. You might have noticed. Maybe you're not seeing this show quite as often on YouTube or elsewhere. Uh, That's that's just what happens. Big tech is now actively suppressing conservatives. This has a lot to do with the election, but it happens in non-election years too. The left wants to silence and remove any voices they don't disagree with. Remember, Twitter was supposed to be an open platform. Doesn't seem so open anymore. Instead of letting social media sites revoke your right to free speech, How about revoking their right to your data? Now, one thing you could do is you could just deactivate all of your social media platforms. That just sort of lets them win, though, doesn't it? You don't want to do that. Instead, I would recommend ExpressVPN. So, you know, social media sites make all their money by by tracking your searches, your video history, everything that you click on, and then selling your valuable data. When you use ExpressVPN, you anonymize much of your online presence by hiding your IP address. That makes your activity much more difficult to trace and sell to advertisers. You got to watch it. I do not go online now if I don't have a VPN installed. I highly recommend you do too. It's finally time to say no to censorship. Take back your online privacy at expressvpn.com slash Michael. By visiting my special link, you will get an extra three months of ExpressVPN service for free. That is expressvpn.com slash Michael, expressvpn.com slash Michael to protect your data today. Especially now that we got Kamala the cop running as the VP pick. You know, she might look, it might happen. The entire liberal establishment is pushing for the Biden-Harris ticket. Uh, A lot of people have tweeted in and they've said, what what do you think of the Harris ticket? Does it help Biden? Does it hurt Biden? My view on it is it was his only choice. I mean, I've assumed that it was going to be Kamala Harris for weeks now because Biden backed himself into a corner. In the name of diversity, Joe Biden said that he was going to pick a very specific w- woman, and she's got to be black, and so he he really limited his his scope of people in the in the name of diversity. He limited himself to to uh, I don't know what three or four people around the country. One name that was floated was Susan Rice. Susan Rice was the fall man for Benghazi in the Obama administration. And as the Durham investigation comes out into all of the corruption of the Obama admin, probably not a great idea to pick Susan Rice. So she wasn't going to work. Karen Bass, as we've explained on this show many times, is an actual communist. So Karen Bass is the head of the Congressional Black Caucus. She's a you know she's a congressman. Uh, she's 
actively supported Fidel Castro in her career. That was a little bit radical, even for today's Democratic Party. And so you're left with this third choice, very flawed choice, extremely unlikable, but she's the last one left because of the identity politics of the left. You've got Kamala Harris, who is, I guess she's a black woman, or she's a woman of color, at least. Uh, She ran a terrible presidential campaign. The first thing she did was hire up all of Hillary's people. So Hillary, 2016, one of the worst presidential campaigns ever run. And then Kamala Harris, because she is a sort of just establishment candidate, she hires up all of those people. And she launched a particularly vicious attack on Joe Biden during the primaries. That attack was that he's a racist, that he worked with segregationists, that he he opposed busing. Busing is not exactly a popular issue in 2020, but she, she launched it. She thought it was her best attack. It flopped. But I guess in the end, it worked out because she's going to be his running mate now. And I think the slogan is going to be racist Harris 2020. I don't know how, how convincing that's going to be. Kamala, though, is not the only endorsement that Joe Biden got over the past couple days. He, he also got a very pow- much more powerful than Kamala Harris. He got the endorsement of China. This, according to Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi uh, went on TV. She went on CNN to describe the state of the race. And I don't know why. I think she may have been having a senior moment herself. She admitted what we all know, which is that China, America's number one geopolitical adversary, is rooting for Joe Biden. But the Chinese, they, what, what, the, what they said is China would prefer Joe Biden, whether they do, that's their conclusion, that they would prefer Joe Biden. Is that a good thing? I mean, what she's referring to here is uh, Bill Evanina, who's the director of the National Counterintelligence and Security Center. Uh, he suggested that Russia, you know, is rooting for President Trump. They, I mean, they've been s- suggesting this since 2015, uh, but that China and Iran would prefer Joe Biden. And it just shows you how in their own bubble Democrats are, or that, that Nancy Pelosi thinks that an endorsement from China will help him. Because this, this is what we've been told for the past 30 years, the kind of liberal establishment with some Republicans and certainly all of the Democrats have hailed the rise of China. They've encouraged it. They've, they've actively supported it at various times. And the idea here was that if you rise up China, if you give them a lot of money and you let them cheat on trade deals and you let them steal technology, then eventually they're going to be super duper rich and they're going to democratize. It's sort of like make China very, very rich, step A. Step B, we don't know. Step C, they're going to become a Madisonian republic. It's that step B. It just hasn't happened. It hasn't happened at all. And then China obviously inflicted on us this Wuhan virus, which has shut down the entire world for the past six months. Uh, So there are a lot of problems here. They've taken a lot of American jobs. They've stolen a lot of American technology. They've spied on us a lot of times. They've cheated on trade deals. They've devalued their own currency. I mean, they've done all these sorts of terrible things. But according to the global world order, China is good. This is why Mike Bloomberg didn't want to criticize China. This is why three of the four big tech oligarchs, when they testified on Capitol Hill, didn't want to criticize China. Only Zuckerberg would even admit that they're stealing our technology. That view is not a left-right thing. That's a liberal establishment over the entire world thing compared to uh, we the people, <laughs> you know, compared to, to common sense people on both sides of the aisle. And on this divide, you know, if you kind of shake yourself out of this mere left-right Republican-Democrat divide, if you, if you see it more as we the people who want politics versus the uh, administrative technocratic elites, you see that uh, Joe Biden's campaign is only geared toward that kind of administrative state. We'll get to that in one second. However, first, I've got to thank our friends over at Raycon. You know about Raycon. I've told you about Raycon before, haven't I? You need a pair of wireless earbuds. That is mandatory in 2020. If you still have wires dangling from your ears, it's like you're living in the Stone Age. You need to get them. They make life much easier. Raycon earbuds started about half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds on the market. And they sound just as amazing as the other top brands that you know. I'm not going to name names, okay? I'm not going to go throw stones at people, but I am going to say Raycon. They sound great. They're a totally fair price. They look really good, too. Their newest model, the Everyday E25 earbuds, are their best ones yet with six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a more compact design that gives you a nice noise-isolating fit. Raycon's earbuds are so comfortable. They are perfect for conference calls. They're perfect for listening to podcasts, especially perfect for listening to The Michael Knowles Show. Highly recommend that. Uh, The company was co-founded by Ray J and a bunch of other celebrities. Now is the time to get the latest and greatest from Raycon. You can get 
15% off your order right now at buyraycon.com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. That is buyraycon.com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, for 15% off Raycon wireless earbuds. What's that address? I'll tell you again, buyraycon.com slash Knowles. This is the real issue, I think. The issue is not one of right versus left. It is we the people versus the administrative state, the elites who appoint themselves to govern this whole country without any real accountability to the voters. I think that's the big difference here. And we've, we've talked about that before. It's been called the administrative state, the deep state, the bureaucracy, the technocracy. That is who Joe Biden is running for. One thing that was so shocking about the Kamala Harris pick is that she attacked him harder than anybody else in the in the Democratic primary. And she attacked him in a particularly vicious way. You know, there's, there's nothing worse that you can be called in modern America than a racist. It, racism has just become the term for bad. I mean, it's become the term for evil. And she went after him that way. So why pick him? It's because the Democrats don't look at individuals. Right? Joe Biden is not an individual. Joe Biden is an empty suit. He is the absence of a candidate. He is not only the absence of a candidate in himself because there's a lot of wind blowing in between his ears. He is also the absence of a candidate in the campaign. He's not campaigning. He's not going out there. They just want someone to be the face of the bureaucracy. And as far as as that goes, Kamala Harris fits the description as well. What what does Kamala Harris believe? That's, That's going to be the title of my next brilliant blank book. It's going to be called What Kamala Harris Believes, A Comprehensive Guide. There's not going to be anything in it, obviously. She will switch her opinions based on public opinion polls. She will lie through her teeth. I mean, she wanted to pander on that show, The Breakfast Club, one time. So she talked about how she loved smoking joints and listening to Snoop Dogg when she was in college, years before Snoop Dogg ever even made an album. It, now, I'm not, I don't know if she smoked pot or she, she probably didn't smoke pot. It's just a thing that she says to pander. She doesn't care. And the same goes for Joe Biden. Joe Biden tweeted out yesterday something that I think typifies his candidacy, and what it means for the Democrats. He says, I promise you, if I'm elected, I won't waste any time getting this virus under control. I'll call Dr. Fauci and ask him to stay on. I'll bring together top experts and leaders from both parties to chart a path forward. We'll get it done together. If your entire campaign is, I'm going to give all my power to Dr. Fauci, why don't I just elect Dr. Fauci? Why am I electing you, Joe Biden? His whole candidacy is, I'll get other people to do stuff. I'm Joe Biden. I'm Joe Biden. You have to elect me so that I can get other people to do things. First of all, Dr. Fauci hasn't been right about anything. I mean, Dr. Fauci has been completely wrong. He's been in that job for, what, 40 years now. No one's ever elected him. He's just the face of the bureaucracy. And what Joe Biden is saying here, when he says, we'll keep Fauci on, we'll get through, is what he's saying is, we will return Away from this crazy Trump moment where we the people got a voice all of a sudden, we will return to rule by the administrative state. This this project began 100 years ago with Woodrow Wilson, where Woodrow Wilson explicitly says this. He says, we want to divorce politics from administration. So what's politics? When you go out there, you give a speech, you say, we got these issues, and we're going to fight for these issues. And then some other candidate says, we're, we're going to have other issues, and we're going to oppose that other guy. Right? That's politics. And then you decide. Administration is just carrying out orders, right? You know, an administration exists in every institution. So who decides then what the rule is? Well, increasingly, the rules are being made by these headless bureaucrats at these agencies that have no accountability whatsoever. You know, the presidents come and go, but the bureaucrats remain the same. And so the left views this. They say, ah, yes, finally, we get to just plug in absolutely pointless people to enforce our agenda that we were going to do anyway. And what is the name for this? Well, the Washington Post is already calling it historic. Historic. This from Jennifer Rubin, who is a Democrat, she's a Democrat writer at the Washington Post, who for some reason pretends to be a Republican, but she, she doesn't support anything Republicans support. She doesn't support any Republican candidates and she's in no way a conservative, but, but the fake news is so fake that they will look you in the eye. They will, they will hire a Democrat have her write Democrat columns every single week and then tell you she's a conservative. That happens all the time. So the headline for this column, it's been a rotten process, but we can appreciate the milestone of the first female VP. First female VP. 
because Biden's already won, I guess, according to them. You know, this headline is assuming that Joe Biden's going to win. They're just assuming it because, of course, he'll win. That's what we want, and that's the science of history, and that's, that's where we've got to go. And, you know, Trump wasn't supposed to win the first time. There was an accident, some glitch in the system, but don't worry. We're going to cheat him out of it this time, and, and this time Joe Biden is going to win. If, if they're just talking about the first female VP candidate, first of all, we've had other female VP candidates before, but we had one very recently. We had one in 2008. That was Sarah Palin. You remember her? Do you think the Washington Post was publishing columns? You know, this is a wonderful milestone. It's historic. It's so important. It's so wonderful that she got picked. I don't think so. There's nothing historic about it. Joe Biden told us months ago he was going to pick a woman. So what's historic? There's no surprise. He didn't even have to write this column. But th that's how they view it. You know what was really historic? Trump's victory. Because no one thought that was going to happen. Because we were told 99% chance Hillary wins. That was historic. You know what was historic? The popular Tea Party movement. That was, that was a genuinely grassroots campaign of co completely peaceful protesters who would show up to a rally site and leave that rally site cleaner than it was before they got there. They weren't stealing Gucci or Nike sneakers. That was historic. But for some reason... That never goes down in the annals of history. And the reason for this is the left has believed for over 100 years that they've discovered the science of history. They know what's going to happen. They know what progress is. So you can either be on the right side of that or the wrong side of that. When, when things contradict their view of history, you know, they ignore them. You know, they say, oh, that wasn't supposed to happen. But then they get right back on the track. The mainstream media knows what's going to happen in the future. That's why they're already running stories on the future. The mainstream media are bracing for sexist attacks on Kamala Harris. Take a listen. Ali, good to talk to you about this. So uh, tell us a little bit about these groups and, and what kind of uh, negative attacks are they bracing for based on what we've seen with previous women politicians and candidates who have run for political office? You know, it's one thing when the Democrats report fake news, when something happens and then the Democrats lie about it or they spin it so egregiously that you can't recognize it. It's another thing entirely when the Democrats spread fake news about things that haven't happened yet. They, yes, these groups are bracing for sexist. We know they're coming. Oh, yeah. You know what Trump is going to say? Oh, it's so He should be impeached for what he's going to say. He's, you know what these right wingers are going to They should be censored on social media for the things that they haven't yet said but are going to say. That's it. I mean, that's the science of history, right? They're, they're predicting what's going to happen. Meanwhile, just a note on sexist attacks. Just a note on that previous female vice presidential candidate for the Republicans. Did you ever see these kind of pearl-clutching, hand-wringing ringing segments about Sarah Palin? After the awful, what you could call sexist attacks on her? No, I don't think so. Do you think anyone was predicting, oh, you're going to be the awful attacks on Sarah Palin? No, because the same people who are worried about those attacks on, Sarah, on, on Kamala Harris were the ones launching the attacks on Sarah Palin. So the MSNBC feminist reporter, I don't know, I don't know what her actual title is, she gives this report on what's going to happen. A lot of these women's groups are looking back at 2016 and seeing the way that President Trump used to dog whistle all the time about Hillary Clinton's gender. I remember I used to hear him th say things like she lacked the strength and stamina to be president. You're not allowed to say that about Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton, who famously lacks the strength and stamina to be president. You're not allowed to say that about her because she's a woman. doesn't matter if it's true about the individual. She's a woman. And so you're not allowed to say that. And specifically, she's a Democrat woman. Notice implicit in the argument here. They're not asking, does Hillary Clinton lack strength? Does Hillary Clinton lack, lack stamina? Hillary Clinton famously passed out as she was walking to her car during that campaign. She was always fatigued. She admitted this in an interview. She said, I'm chronically fatigued. I fall asleep the second I sit down on airplanes. So it's, it's obviously true of her that she lacked the strength and stamina. But what the left says is we don't care about the particulars. We don't care about, we don't care who's running in 2020. Who's Joe Biden? Who cares? He's just a filler. He's a filler for history, which will inevitably move toward the left. And he'll do whatever we want. Kamala Harris, same thing. She said a bunch of stuff. She smeared our top. Who no one cares. No one's voting for either of these people. These people are very unlikable. They're just voting for the left-wing project broadly. Left-wing project broadly, by the way, might win. 
That's the worry. Because a lot of people don't want to engage in politics. You know, I'm here at this Claremont Fellowship, and we're talking about the founding and, and what that means and how it's played out over the course of American history. And John Marini, one of the scholars here, made a great point yesterday, which is that increasingly, everything is politicized. And the NFL is politicized. The MLB is politicized. Nike shoes are politicized. Everything in our whole culture is politicized, except for politics. Except for politics. You, you must have a political opinion about every single thing on earth, but you are not allowed to have a political opinion about politics because politics has been taken away from the people and given to these faceless bureaucrats. Some of them occasionally they pop up and you remember their name like Dr. Fauci. But they're the ones making our political decisions for us. All the little alphabet agencies that operate out of the executive branch but have no accountability to it, really, they're the ones who are actually ruling us. And, and in part, I think it's why the left distracts us with a bunch of stupid side issues is so that we can all chatter about some nonsense and not engage in actual politics, which is being done by the left-wing experts. So we've got the dog whistles that are certainly going to come against Kamala Harris, and the only people hearing these dog whistles are leftists. What does that say about them? It seems to suggest they are the dogs. But regardless of these sexist attacks, i got to say this for President Trump, at least he can bring himself to say the word woman The same cannot be said of CNN, which recently gave a report on not how how pregnant women are reacting to COVID. They coined a new phrase, pregnant people. Women are are feeling nervous about expanding their their family or starting a family because of the pandemic. Why? That's exactly right, Anne-Marie. And they're worried for two different reasons. One, simply health reasons. There's so much that we don't know about the coronavirus in general, and then how that impacts pregnant people in a unique way. Pregnant people. Hold up a sec. Now, you just realized that, that wasn't even CNN. You expect this stuff of CNN. That was CBS. That was a network news channel. That was something that a lot of people watch. A lot more people watch that than watch CNN. So, so this kind of language, this taking away sex, taking away gender, eliding everything, this weird doublespeak, This is now infecting the total mainstream, right? The actual networks for CBS. That's happening on the other ones as well. So she coins this term, pregnant people. But the thing you have to remember is, this is so unnatural, right? It's so unnatural to deny that biological sex exists. It's it's perhaps the fundamental fact of our nature, sex. So they say it, they get their talking points, they're told how to describe gender, but then she slips in the very same segment. She refers then to women. You have this perfect storm of a public health crisis combined with what we're anticipating to be a gigantic economic crisis. And the result is that a lot of women and families are simply saying now is not the right time to be either starting or expanding a family. A lot of women and families. Why use the phrase woman in one place but not in the other place? There was another term that was coined by the media the other day, uh, individual with a cervix. (laughs) <laughs> there was some media outlet that said, yes, I think it was CNN. It's always CNN. In my mind, they're all CNN. In any case, they said, you know, cervical cancer specialists are saying that individuals with a cervix should get screened for cancer. There's a shorter phrase for individuals with a cervix. There is a, a more precise phrase for people who get pregnant. It's women. So even this woman, on, on this, even this individual with uh, whatever body parts they, that she has, this person says, you know, we're talking about women, right? Because she kind of loses her train of thought. But what is being pushed and normalized is this idea that sex doesn't matter at all. And this is extremely degrading to women. I never want to hear that Trump is demeaning toward women or sexist against women or misogynistic or whatever. Again, I don't want to hear it. Because there's a song called WAP. Is it WAP or WAP? I don't know. This is put out here by an artist named Cardi B. I know that uh, Ben got in trouble for this the other day because Ben just read the lyrics of this disgusting song. It's probably the most disgusting song I've ever heard. This is actual audio pornography, which I didn't know could exist. Uh, ben got in trouble for it. So, you know, obviously we've got to get into it here. I, thought, what? I didn't even watch Ben's clip, uh, but people were very upset that he was calling this out. So I, it made me go and listen to the song. This thing is so obscenely degrading to women. But that's not just, that's not the only point I have to make about it. 
If that were it, you know, look, that's rap music. Rap music is always degrading to women. The, the point about this is the degradation of the, the individual and the degradation of American society and the degradation of our interpersonal relations. So the song begins. I'll have to clean this up as I go, I suppose. It opens up with a repeated line. There's some whores in this house, sung by a woman. She's very proud of this. She's accepting her identity as a whore. She's reveling in that. Spit in my mouth, look in my eyes, saying, you know, degrade me. I want to be degraded, and I want you to acknowledge that you are degrading me while you do it. I don't cook, I don't clean, but let me tell you how I got this ring, AA. I'm skipping around to just the lines that I think really tell you something here. Beyond the, the, the language of most of it is so disgusting, I certainly can't read it on the show. But listen to that. I don't cook, I don't clean, but let me tell you how I got this ring. What she's saying is, marriage is transactional. No man would want to marry a woman because he loves her, because there is something lovable about her, because he wants to give of himself to her. A man would only marry a woman to get something. And so what could, what could he get? Well, the traditional model that we're rejecting is that you know men marry women so they can cook and clean for them. But what this enlightened, empowered woman is saying is, no, I, we don't do that. That would be degrading. Uh, this man uh, condescended to marry me because I do f- filthy sexual acts on him all the time, and I allow him to degrade me. So that's why, and that's why this is much more empowered. Now, of course, this is a caricature of what marriage used to be. Marriage was not merely a fact of you go and you hire a woman to cook and clean for you. There's a little aspect of that, but more it's about giving yourself to the other person in this union for life. But because of that progressive misunderstanding of the past, which is, you know, the past has to be awful, so things always have to be worse in the past, and things, we, we also apply this highly economic model of, how, of interpersonal relations, very selfish model of interpersonal relations. We, we apply that retroactively on the past, uh, even as we reject it. So she's viewing the, the past through that lens, but then, because now we're all enlightened and everything's about sex, she's saying, no, 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 it's much more empowering that I, I conned my husband into marrying me uh, by performing a lot of strange things on his body. Ask for a car while you ride that thingy. I don't know. I won't, I won't, use, uh, <laughs> I won't use her language. Ask for a car, right? As in, I'm not doing this to my husband because I love him. He's not doing it to me because he loves me. This is just transactional. But don't forget, we're not talking, you know, it says there's some whores in this house. What, what Cardi B is saying here fundamentally is that the, the relations between the sexes are, are transactional and, and wi- all women are whores. I mean, that's, that's the point here is even, even with your husband, you are engaging in something that is no different from prostitution. Uh, another line here, he bought a phone just for pictures of this uh, particularly desirable genitalia. Again, she uses different words. He bought a phone for it. So she's kind of tricked him into spending money to a, a third party, right, to a, this kind of capitalist culture, some company, to turn me into a porn actress so that he can then go away from me and do whatever he's going to do to himself looking at these pictures, right? It's, it's, you're divorcing, you're making it so transactional that by the end of that line, the woman's not even there anymore. She's not even the one performing the sex acts. She has become nothing more than a commodity that you are using. Not, you know, you're, you're not just using her to get a thrill in person. You're using her to get a thrill in perpetuity on yourself. Pay my tuition just to kiss me on this desirable genitalia. Now make it rain if you want to see some desirable genitalia. Put me through school. Don't put me through school to make me better, to you know, edify me so that we can have this wonderful life together. No, no, no. It's just a con. Even education here is just about getting something over on the other person. The way we think of love and education traditionally is it makes us better. It's a positive good, but not here. It's all a zero-sum game. For the left. And then this, this line, oh my gosh. Switch my wig, make him feel like he cheating, put him on his knees, give him something to believe in. There it is. Switch my wig, meaning I'm going to dress up like I'm not me. I'm going to be somebody else. And this is going to excite 
my husband. It's going to make him desire me because my husband is getting tired of me. He's, he no longer desires me. This kind of cheap transactional sex has run its course. So now I'm going, to, I'm going to get even more perverse. I'm going to pretend like I'm some other other woman. And that will finally excite him a little bit more, at least for now. And then the key, put him on his knees, give him something to believe in. Because he, he believes in nothing. She believes in nothing. None of these people believe in anything beyond the satisfaction of their own selfish appetites and desires. And so she will make an idol out of not just herself, but a very particular part of herself. And this will finally give him something to believe in. It's an acknowledgement, actually, that man is fundamentally a religious being. It's an acknowledgement that we want something that is beyond this world, that is beyond the satisfaction of our selfish desires. But we have no outlet for that. We don't know, we don't even know how to talk about that anymore. And so the, the nearest we can get is audio pornography to, to describe a way to trick your senses into believing that you've transcended that appetite and, and given, given in to something higher. There was a similar literary analysis made about this by Suki Hana. I don't know who that is. We'll get to that in one second. First, though, I got to thank you. I got to thank you for going over and subscribing to the Michael Knoll Show YouTube channel. There are many reasons to head on over to like, subscribe, and most importantly, share the videos on that channel. And the main one is YouTube's messing with us. <laughs> they don't want people to see those videos. So head on over. YouTube has now demonetized half of all of our videos, which I don't really care about because I don't get a percentage of that money. So I don't, you know, that's fine by me. I don't care, you know, Ben's not going to get as much on the view. That's fine. But people aren't going to see it. People aren't seeing this kind of stuff. They are, they are throttling the show. So please head on over and specifically share. That really helps us out. Also, let's talk about All Access. All Access members get to join in All Access Live. I did one last night. It was great, you know, because I've been traveling the past couple of weeks. Though it's always good to check in and hang out with the Daily Wire members. Right now, if you uh, join All Access, you get two, not one, but two Leftist Years tumblers with your membership, as well as early exclusive new Daily Wire products, which you saw last week uh, with our limited edition collector's baseball bat that, uh, you know, sold out before I could get a copy. It was only uh, available to All Access members who so sign up right now. Head on over to dailywire.com slash Knowles. You get 20% off all access with coupon code ACCESS. dailywire.com slash Knowles, coupon code ACCESS to get 20% off your membership. We'll be right back with a lot more. So after we've just in, indulged this literary analysis of of Cardi B, of <laughs> WAP. Uh, oh, I, you know, oh my gosh, it just occurred to me. That's that's the acronym that that uh, Cardi B is talking about for her particularly desirable genitalia, apparently. So that's that's gross. Here is some YouTuber performer. I don't know, Suki Hana, talking about what the what the song means to her. I feel like being like sexual and shit, like. I don't see nothing wrong with that because, baby, I got uh, uh, three kids. And, I mean, I got these kids from and f At the end of the day, me being a hoe, like these people say, like, honestly, I liberate a lot of a lot of hoes. You feel me? When I hear Cardi talk about popping some me and my bitch is with it. Like, we, that liberate us because it's like, f*** you, self-respect as hoes. Cause how y'all got self-respect? Like... I don't think y'all got self-respect like that. Cause first of all, you supposed to tax these n****s, that's self-respect. You feel me? Like, I just, it make me feel liberated. Like I love crossing boundaries. Cause guess what? Scare money don't make no money. If you gonna be scared to get that money, you gonna be scared to be yourself and say this who I am, then you ain't gonna get that coin like that. You're not gonna get that coin like that. Cause scared money don't make no money. And human relations, including the most intimate relations, including the, one of the deepest desires of our heart, love for another person, is all just about money, making money. As a biological point, uh, that woman Suki Hana describes the way that she produced her children. Only one of those uh, actually in, uh, led to her children. She describes two activities. Only one of them actually did it. So there's some confusion there. So there's some confusion on the broader point. What is our relationship about? I think a lot of people today view sexual relationships and romantic relationships as transactional. You do this for me, I do this for you. 
you know, both on sort of dates, it's like Tinder culture, swipe right, like, okay, I'm going to pay for dinner and then, you know, whatever, we'll see what happens and shake hands and never see you again. Uh, but there's also, you also see this in relationships. I mean, even, even at a kind of higher level than this, but not much higher, you see people say, oh yes, I picked my spouse because she's going to, she's going to help me in my career. I'm focused on my career and it's going to go this way and I need someone who does this and therefore, and she'll be good and, you know, or vice versa, this person's going to make a lot of money and then this will help here. And it's all about you. Prenuptial agreements, same thing. It's all about you. How are you going to protect yourself when this thing eventually breaks off? It's all about, you got to make sure you get yours. Very different than the traditional view. You know, Elisa likes to remind me, we're Catholic. There's no out. There's no out. <laughs> this is it for life, man. Uh, and, and there's something really healthy and salutary about, about that knowledge that <laughs> this is about much more than a transaction and selfish desires, that, that there are certain bonds that are unbreakable. But in our consumerist culture, we don't have that. And that's not actually just the left's fault. It's also the right. I mean, the right in its obsession with economics in the last 30 years, basically selling out their principles just to make an extra buck on whatever policy is, is popular of the day, you know, pretending that free trade is the great international unfettered free trade. It, that's the bedrock conservative principle. No, of course it's not. Politics. We want to conserve things. We want to conserve the good. Free trade can be wonderful, but, but free trade, all of these kind of technocratic policies that are administered by bureaucrats, they are subordinate to a real politics, to an authentic politics where we decide for ourselves what we want and where we can ideally live the virtues which people are not living when they, when they listen to and perform WAP. So President Trump, I think he's uh, a, lot, a lot better for women than any of this kind of stuff. And by the way, you can just track it too. There have been a number of, of surveys done of, of happiness, so take it with a grain of salt. But since women's liberation, since we were told that degrading sexual activities uh, actually empower women, women's happiness has declined precipitously, both relative to men, obviously, you know, and in, in absolute terms. It's declined. This idea that women are going to be empowered and happy and flourishing, uh, it hasn't happened. The opposite has happened. But we can't let Trump off the hook. As Trump made a comment, it was sexist, misogynist chauvinist, ist, ist, I don't know, so terrible. The left is furious. He was asked about the vice presidential pick and, you know, Kamala Harris or any of these other women. And he said, well, you know, Biden said he was going to pick a woman. And I think a lot of men are offended by that. Take a listen. First of all, he roped himself into, uh, you know, a certain group of people. Which he said is he fine. had to pick a woman. He, he said that. And, you know, some people would say that men are insulted by that. And some people would say it's fine. I, I don't know. Look, some people would say that. OK, I'm not saying that, but maybe I could say that if I wanted to say that, which I haven't done. But some people certainly have. I, lo I love the Trump circumlocution to just get ideas out in the world. He's absolutely right. Men should be very offended by what Joe Biden said, not because he picked a woman running mate. I don't think she is going to help him in particular, but that's not why. It's not the fact that he picked a woman. It's the fact that he's picking a woman simply for being a woman. He's picking a black person simply for being a black person. As if to say, I don't care about any of the qualities that this person has. I just want to check this box. And so I'm going to cut off half of the population, more than half the population, because he said it has to be a black woman. I'm going to cut off more than half the population I don't care what the content of their character is. I don't care about their virtues uh, because I, I just want to check this box. The individuals, the people don't matter. We're riding this wave of history. We're on the right side of history. So you just have to fill in the slots. Uh, we were talking to this, the same great scholar, John Marini, yesterday about this. And, uh, you know, th this, uh, this problem of the, the individual is a big one. I mean, this, this problem of not being a, it, it, like, they don't view the people in any way as individuals. They just view them as vessels to, uh, to you know, advance their agenda. Martin Luther King's line, I, I have a dream that one day my children will play with white children and they won't be judged by the color of their skin. They'll be judged by the content of their character. What Marini was pointing out is this, that line doesn't make any sense today. It's, it's not a meaningful phrase. People don't know what it means because in order to judge someone on the content of their character, you have to have an objective standard by which to judge character, and the left has destroyed that. The way you used to do it is by the virtues, 
by objective virtue, which you can name and you can measure, and we were all told it, but we, we no longer share that view of, of mankind. Objective virtue has been replaced, in, uh, in John Marini's words, by subjective values. And values are just preferences. You and I, we can have whatever values we want. It's like, uh, yeah, well, I value chocolate ice cream, you value vanilla ice cream. I value Coke, you value Pepsi, I, right? You can't judge them. And so you can't, you can't judge someone on the content of their character. The left doesn't even want to try. They're only judging them, not on metaphysical criteria, but on physical criteria. And that's it. That's all. So they've got their DNC speakers, right? Obviously, Biden and Kamala are going to speak. We've got uh, Bill Clinton. If he's not, you know, in an orange jumpsuit because of what's come out about the Epstein Island, he'll be there. Somebody tells me he'll get out of it. Although, I don't know. If he, this might be finally Hillary's last revenge. <laughs> Watch out, Bill. Uh, Bernie Sanders is going to speak. Andrew Cuomo, who has uh, handled coronavirus worse than any governor in the entire country. Andrew Cuomo, whose policies are responsible for killing thousands of senior citizens. He'll be speaking because, don't forget, the Democrats anointed him before coronavirus. It doesn't matter what he does. They, the, it, it, he can do no wrong. So, for instance, the Democrats are furious at Trump for, for uh, you know, the way he's handled coronavirus. On every objective measure, Cuomo's done worse, but Cuomo, they like Cuomo. So Cuomo, Cuomo he's shown leadership. He's going to be, I don't know, who knows, he could, could replace Joe Biden for, for all that we know at the convention. But most likely he won't, so Cuomo is going to speak. Whitmer, also terribly, uh, she's handled this whole thing terribly. She's governor of Michigan. She'll speak Schumer, Kerry. Oh my gosh, these people are just, they've been around forever. AOC, that's the one kind of new person who's been anointed as a leader of the Democratic Party. And then my favorite speaker at the DNC, John Kasich. John, you remember that name, John Kasich? John Kasich is uh, the formerly Republican governor of Ohio. His father, you might remember, is a mailman. John Kasich, he's taking this principled stand, principled that he's going to oppose Donald Trump, principled conservative stand he's going to vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, the most pro-abortion ticket in American history. Principled stand. So what's it really about? Kasich was interviewed about this, and Kasich defended his decision to speak at the DNC, the way he defended it shows you the, the big issue of politics here. Again, it's not just left-right. It's this issue of we the people versus the self-appointed benevolent better elites. Kasich in his own words. I think I have a right to define what it means to be a conservative. Hold up. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> you, John Kasich, have uh, less of a right than anybody in this country, probably including Jennifer Rubin, to define what it is to be a conservative because you're a sellout. You're a hack. You don't believe in anything. You're not conservative. Even if, even if we just judged you by your policies and nothing else that pertain to your political career, you're kind of a moderate, squishy Republican. You don't have any right to define what it means to be a conservative. Just a minor technical point. Here's the substance of his defense. And that means uh, a government, when necessary, uh, not op opposed to it, that what the conservative movement ought to be is opportunity for everyone. The Republican Party ought to be a party that has a positive message of lifting everyone. But, you know, Aaron, look, leaders walk a lonely road. And if you're not prepared to walk a lonely road and do the things that your conscience tells you to do, then how do you think about yourself when you look in the mirror? I mean, I'm comfortable with the decisions I make. Of course there's blowback. You know, Republicans are critical. Some are, are praising me. Democrats are debating themselves. Should he be able to do this? But this is not an unusual place for me to be. I've been a reformer almost all of my life. I've been very independent. And I'm a Republican, but the Republican Party has always been my vehicle, but never my master. You have to do what you think is right in your heart, and I'm comfortable here. How many times did John Kasich use the first person singular pronoun in that defense? Compare this, no one's picking up on this, but it sums up the whole issue. What principles did John Kasich just allude to? What big political issues, what broad political vision did he allude to? Not none. His references were to himself. Well, look, I look at myself in the mirror and I'm very comfortable with me and I've done a good job and people are criticizing me and people are praising me and I think I've done good and I've got this idea and the Republican Party's fine, but it's really just about me. Me, me, me. I, me, my. All through the night. I, me, mine. I, me, mine. I, me, mine. Me, me, me. And that's basically 
the entire Never Trump coalition that's left. How many are there left? Like three or four people. They pretend it's about principles. It's not. It's just about them, themselves. They can't articulate. They always say Trump is a narcissist. These people are much more narcissistic than Trump. At least Trump is doing something. Trump had that great meme out the other day, said, they're not coming after me. They're coming after you, and I just happen to be in the way. That's it. That sums it up. He always talks about we the people. Hillary Clinton in 2016 said, it's about me. So, you know, if I'm with her. And he said, uh, I'm with you. That shift of who the I is here and who the object is here, that tells you a lot. Ronald Reagan said this too. He said, people have always called me the great communicator. It's not that I'm, I'm the great communicator. It's that I'm communicating great ideas, great ideas from the heart of the American people. It's about you. It's about other people. We the people. That's a big distinction here. For the Democrats, they don't care what you want. They don't care what you are, are prioritizing. They don't want you to engage in authentic politics. They're going to tell you what to do. They've got the kind of liberal agenda. They're not even going to really ask. They're just going to enforce it through the administrative state, the deep state, the bureaucracy. And the, and the Republican candidate here, Trump, is saying something else. He's saying, we're going to empower you. It's going to be weird. It's not going to follow all the conventions that we've had in, in recent years, but we're going to do that anyway. And uh, we're going to crack up this administrative bureaucracy. Those are the choices. Those obviously cut across party lines. Obviously, John Kasich is going to speak at the DNC. But that's a much more important distinction than Republican Democrat or conservative liberal or progress, whatever. That is a big distinction. Are we going to have politics? Are we going to engage in it? Are we going to empower people to, to choose things for themselves? Or are we not? That's your choice in front of us. You've got Empty suit racist, empty suit VP, whatever, 2020. That's the Democratic. And obviously they'll change their tune and Kamala Harris will say, Joe Biden's the least racist guy in the world. What they're saying doesn't matter. They are, they're not, obviously they're not listening to we the people. They are going to push that same agenda that they always have. And then you got Trump and you like him, you hate him, you're lukewarm, warts and all. You've got Trump giving a voice to the people. That's your choice. Let's see if your vote will count in November. That's our show. I'm Michael Knowles. It's The Michael Knowles Show. See you tomorrow. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Ben Davies. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Supervising producers, Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. Assistant director, Pavel Widowski. Editor and associate producer, Danny D'Amico. Audio mixer, Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup, Nika Geneva. Production assistant, Ryan Love. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. You know, the Matt Wall Show, it's not just another show about, about politics. I think there are enough of those already out there. We talk about culture because culture drives politics and it drives everything else. So my main focuses are life, family, faith. Those are fundamental and that's what this show is about. I hope you'll Give it a listen.